Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Spring Clean Your Business and Systems. Just a quick check. Can you hear me okay? And can you see my screen? If you can raise your hands, that would be great. Excellent. Great to see everyone join us here today. Today's session is very much going to be focused in and around some of the things that we look towards when we are at this time of the year. It's all about looking at spring cleaning. Now, why spring cleaning? If you're like me, your kitchen probably looks a little bit like what you see here on the left. However, we want to move over towards that nice clean focus over to the right. And really, the reason why we want to do all of this is because we want to focus on the key bits and key areas of our information. As Herbert Simon, one of the Nobel Prize winners said, in an information rich world, the wealth of information means a dearth of something else. In this case, our focus and a scarcity of whatever that is, is the information consumes. Which means if we're focusing so much on the busyness, we're not necessarily gonna have time to focus on what is most important. So what do we have in our business? We have lots of things that are consuming our attention. We have stock, we make things, we buy things. We keep track of them, we keep track of the payment and we take care of the care and feeding. At the heart of all of this, of course, live our customers. So for today's session, what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on the customers and look at each one of these areas in turn. We're gonna start at the high level, and from there, we're going to go ahead and start drilling into some of the things that we want to think about and some of the things that we can do to improve. So if I take a look at customers, let's start with the concept of reviewing and assessing. What are some of the things and areas of focus we have? Price maintenance, quotations, what are we doing with our existing order book? How are we managing our credit payment? And of course, drill down to the lowest level of detail when we come into the master data. So let's start with the review and assessment. As we said, it all begins with the customers. Do we know who our most important customers are? Do we know how much profitability we're getting? Do we know how many goods we're transferring to them? Do we know where our customers are? Have we put any of them on hold? And if we have, why? What I'd like to do is rather than give you screenshots, I'm actually gonna show you a little bit about where you can go within SysPro to take a look at this yourself and run through some of the analysis. We're gonna start with the, some of the standard tools that you have available within the toolkit. Each one of these will depend on how you use your entire system as well and how it's configured, but they're great starting points for you to be able to start assessing. So if I flip over, I've got my lovely installation of Cisbro 8 all ready to go. And what I've done is I've shown you the programs. Now with the programs themselves, what I'm gonna do is open it up. In this case, we're focusing on customers, which means I wanna drill into my accounts receivable, which is where my customers lie. Within that, you see a list of rich reports that are available to you. Couple ones that I would start out with, are the list of customers and the list of customer details. Customer details will give you information around where you've got the customer data held, what addresses information, what geographic areas do they sit in, which branches are they associated with, who are the salespeople that are managing them. The list of customers starts drilling into information around the pricing, whether we have them on hold. If you want to do further analysis, we can now take a little bit of detailed information around master sub accounts. Do they have relationships across the accounts? Are they in multiple locations? Do we want to look perhaps at expanding and being able to deliver and service these customers even better? Do we want to expand the amount of locations that we store within them? And the reports will highlight areas of information that we can populate within SysPro itself. So those are the three that I would start with when we're focusing just in around analyzing who our customers are and when they sit. The next thing we wanna look at, of course, is in and around pricing. 
when we're tidying up our pricing right now, that's making the news all over the place with the increase in inflation, the details in and around how price pressures are affecting everyone from consumers all the way up. And one of the things that companies historically and traditionally look at are associated with cost plus pricing. What I want to challenge you to do is as you're thinking about pricing and approaching this, think about it slightly differently. Because historically, research has shown that consumers, especially when we're dealing with inflationary pressures, will be looking at three kinds of savings. They're looking at savings at the trans point of transaction, so discounts. They're looking at accrued savings, which is what can I do to go ahead and put that money in the bank? And especially right now where we've got supply chain pressures, they're looking at sanity savings. They will be willing to pay a premium when it comes to saving them time, perhaps saving complexity. If you're able to deliver something that your competitors aren't able to, they are willing to go ahead and pay a premium for it as well for that peace of mind. So it's about reviewing your pricing to make sure that you're still hitting the mark because fundamentally you don't want to price yourself out in the market, but you definitely don't want to leave money on the table. So as we're looking at pricing, Let's jump back into CISPRO. And if you take a look within the pricing itself, we have a few different ways of capturing it. Now, one of the things you wanna do is you wanna take a look at your discount reports, discount not formats, the outstanding deposits, how are we doing with that? We also want to go ahead and take a look at our pricing. Now, what I wanna do is give you a quick tip so as soon as you want to try and pull something in the program list, Cisper has added this great functionality to be able to allow you to filter and search based on that. So now we can see automatically, I've got a number of areas where I can pull up my pricing. How are you pricing? Do you have your foreign prices? Pricing by price code, contract pricing. You want to make sure that all of those are configured and maintained. The other thing you want to think about is, especially if you're dealing with contract prices, you want to look at your contract price reports. Do you have any expired contracts? Review those based on pricing groups. You want to go ahead and start expanding out those contract pricing and deleting anything that you don't have. So we take a look at customers. We've taken a look at pricing. What else can we take a look at within the customers? Are you quoting to your customers? Are you looking at versioning your quotes? Do you have expired quotes? if you're not versioning them? Have you actually marked them as complete? Within the quotation module itself, you have the ability to filter down, to review the expired quotes, and to go ahead and close out any ones that are not there. Because now, as soon as you close that out, you have the ability to start investigating as to how important those quotes are. So again, let's go ahead and drill down. And if we wanna take a look at the quotation modules, We've got a rich set of information that we have. My list of quotes will give me the ability to filter down as we're drilling down into the open quotes. But the quotation query is really where you're going to go ahead and start opening that up. And you have the ability to see all your different versions of quotes as well. If you haven't got quotation versioning enabled, I would highly recommend doing that because what that allows you to do is intuitively and natively pick up the ability to filter your quotes. All right, whizzing right along, still sticking on to our customers. What are you doing with your order and booking? Are you recognizing all of the revenue that you have? And here's where we want to now start taking a look at orders that are open. They haven't yet been delivered. Do we have outstanding orders that are still yet to be delivered? Do we have orders that are delivered but not yet built? We've got some great standard sales order reports that allow us to drill into the rich information associated with the order and booking system. And in fact, there is also an order and booking report that specifically will allow us to open that up. So if we go ahead and pull that up, in this case, I want to stick say, straight onto my sales orders and within my sales orders. I'm gonna take a look at my order profitability, my backlog report by customer, and I'm gonna focus in here 
on my order and booking report. These are the three key reports that you should be looking at on a periodic basis. Oftentimes what happens, we've come across customers where they may have completed the order, but they may be a freight line, a miscellaneous line that's remaining on there. Has that been completed? Has that been invoiced? We have the ability to go ahead and start pulling that together and closing that out. You've got recognized revenue that you can go ahead and pull through and overall tighten up your order profitability. So I'd highly recommend taking a look at these three reports out of the box to start tidying that up. Now, if you identify that you've got open orders, you want to make sure that you cleanse that data. With the orders themselves, any closed orders, you have the ability to archive those as well, which means you can now start paring down the data that you have stored within Cispro, which means you'll overall speed up your system. We'll go into the archiving a little bit further on. As important as customers are, the credit that we give them is that relationship that we have with them. Now, our really great customers, you've already got good policies in place, but have you reviewed that credit history? When you take on a new customer and you're doing the credit checking, are you storing their credit check details against the individual customer? Are you leveraging the Dunning functionality within Cispro to allow and encourage timely payments, depending on the payment terms that you have, to automate that particular process? Again, some nice, rich reports that are available out of the box in order for you to be able to address the credit management. So if we jump right back, again, in this case, we're sticking from sales orders and accounts receivable. Now I'm going to come back into my accounts receivable section, drill into the reports, and I've got my summary credit management, my credit management report. You want to start drilling into these, being able to pay attention to them. I referred earlier to my Dunning. We have Dunning statuses, Dunning groups, and various formats that you can go ahead and set up in order to manage this. One other little tip that I want to be able to give you. Just by a quick show of hands, if you could, how many of you have customers who are also suppliers? So you're not just selling to them, but you're buying from them as well. So just quick show of hands if you want to throw the, your hands up in the GoToWebinar for me. Yeah, yeah, I see a few hands go up there, definitely. So CISPR has the functionality of being able to do a contra between your accounts receivable and your accounts payable, where you can associate your invoices that you're raising against what you owe the customers. And so I would encourage you to think about leveraging some of that functionality and linking those two up to now go ahead and tie together the contra. So again, I'm going to use my little cheat. And you've got the ability to go ahead and pick up your contra configuration right within the accounts receivable, and as you would expect, within the accounts payable as well. You set them up and you contra your invoices out. This is one that we spent a lot of time and effort on when we first configure our systems, but we don't always go back and review and revisit them. And that's where I would highly encourage us to spend a little bit of time, especially as we're thinking about the spring clean functionality, review your master data. Review your customer details. What information do you have for them on hand? Do you have all the right accurate information? Have you been updating it on a regular basis? Do you have the contact details? Do you have their telephone numbers? Do you have their email addresses? Do you have their locations? Do you have multiple ship to addresses? Earlier in the session, we referenced the fact that if you're selling to them in multiple geographies, if you've become aware that this particular customer is expanded and they have a warehouse that's perhaps closer to where you are, you could negotiate better freight terms for them. Is that something that you want to be able to do? And so by investigating and refreshing your ship to information, your multiple ship to address information, you're able to now go ahead and think a little bit more strategically about them. All your accounts, are they active? Do you have any customers that are currently on hold? Why are they on hold? And this is a good time to go ahead and refresh that and perhaps put in a periodic check to review your on hold customers. 
what are the terms that you've agreed with them? Is that something that we've made sure are still outstanding? What are your contracts? The other element associated with customers is not just against your master data for the customer. It's also tied in to your inventory. And if I focus in and around my stock codes, there are certain things that I would highly recommend you look at when it comes to the master data. Do you have appropriate units of measure that you have configured? Because this will affect the selling price and how the orders get raised. Do you have alternate stock codes that you're offering up to your customers if you've not got something in-house? Are your pricing categories all up to date? We'll come into some of the country of origin details a little bit later on, but certain items, are they returnable or not? So as you're assessing and reviewing your master data, keep these things in mind, tie them back together. All right, we've talked a lot about our customer. I'm gonna spend quite a bit more time talking about inventory. What are we doing around inventory management? Physical check improving your visibility, your control. We're gonna talk a little bit about master data and then for certain organizations, traceability is very key. So it's about looking at what are some of the things we can do around traceability. The first thing I'd recommend doing is do a physical check of your stock. Now I know a lot of companies have rigorous process in place. You've got a stock take that you do where you're getting close to your year end, stock takes part of your process. But I would recommend that you think about incorporating cycle counting, go walk around the warehouse because the stock take will oftentimes just bubble up what you have in the system. Do you have items that you haven't captured in the system in Cispro itself? And as you're doing that, there are two things that I recommend you look for. Do you have something that's been gathering dust? And a physical check will definitely take care of that. And do you have items that you're keeping on board that are currently perhaps obsolete? something that's not necessarily moving as quickly. Do you have slow moving stock? We had a customer recently that unfortunately has had to go ahead and expand their warehouse space because they've just simply run out of room. And part of the reason they've done that is because they have stock for items that they're no longer manufacturing. And when you're doing that, think about the costs, but also think about the opportunity cost. The obvious one is space. We just talked about the fact that it's taking up space, it's taking up the storage. It's costing insurance. It's costing labor. Every time you're having to move something around what you have currently there. And of course, we've got depreciation for any of the finance folks in this particular session. What are some of the things we can do with it? Explore with your engineers. Do you have a new manufacturing design that you might want to incorporate this stock rather than having it be completely written off and obsolete? Can you incorporate that? Can you change it so that you can perhaps change it from something that is non-revenue generating to revenue generating? Do you want to just raise a promotion with your customers to be able to go ahead and get rid of that old stock? Do you want to sell it off? Do you have alternate options, not necessarily your traditional customers, but perhaps in general market spaces? And then of course, if it's not something that you are gonna do anything with, dispose of it and write it off. There are various ways of being able to write it off, adjust it out, destination transfers, zeroing out of the warehouse, but make sure that you're capturing the financial cost associated with that as well. Now, there's lots of considerations you need to think about when you're thinking about writing off. There's, of course, your costing methods, warehouse and bin setup, your history setup. All of that needs to be taken into account. What's your visibility? Do you have all your locations, your physical stock locations? If someone looked at Cispro, would they be able to follow the map that Cispro provides into your warehouse? Would they be able to find it in the bin? Would they be able to find the right serial in that particular bin as well? When you're doing stock take and you're doing cycle counting, you're able to update that information. There are a couple of additional tools that this person introduced that really help with this. The first thing I'd like to suggest is the bin locations. Cispro historically used to allow for anyone to be able to enter a bin in. With the introduction of a new concept called fixed bins, it's an option you enable. And when you enable that, only bins that have been specifically created can be used. And there's a great 
report against the inventory, which shows you what's available in which bin, and there's a standard report that shows you that information. So use that, tidy up any of the old bins that don't exist anymore. And oftentimes it's a case of lowercase, uppercase. So I've got a bin FG and I've entered it four different times, depending on various mixed cases that I have entered in there. Only one of those is a real bin. So it's about tidying all of that up. And then the other thing is serials. They don't always track through properly. And Cisper has got new functionality that allows you to link your serials to your bin locations. So now you've got visibility, not just at the warehouse location, but further down at the bin level itself. Master data, stock codes. Are you shipping to the EU? Do you have all of the custom details that are required for that? We covered quite a bit of this in the Brexit webinar tail end of last year, just as transition was happening. But it's about making sure that you're capturing things such as country of origin, your tariff codes. Those are required on customs documents and Cisper has standard stored information to be able to capture that. What's the status of your stock code? When you look at your stock codes, there are actually some interesting statuses that you can leverage, especially when you've got slow moving stock or you're trying to get rid of it. So you can, against your stock code itself, if I come back into Cisbro, I'll show you a little bit of what we're talking about here rather than just speaking to it. We'll vary it up. So if I take a look at my stock code setup, against the setup itself, we have the ability to capture whether the stock's on hold, and also a status itself that allows to determine whether it's ready to be cleared or a temporary. We've got many, many more details that we can capture against that as well, but this is where we, again, want to go back in and capture our maintenance details. Do we have the appropriate safety stock that we want to be able to capture if we're looking at replenishment? Are we going ahead and having our supplementary details? We talked about country of origin tariff code. All of those are standard fields. I haven't gone ahead and added them in. Are we capturing a cost, pricing details, all accurately in here? So when we're talking about master data, when it comes into our inventory, let's make sure all of that's captured. Traceability. We talked a lot about the empty bins, the serials. The other thing that I want to talk about is expiry. Do you have anything that's getting close to expired? Again, you want to try and make sure that we're selling that off, perhaps at a promotion if there's no risk associated with that or anything that has already been expired, dispose of it and go ahead and write it off because otherwise you're gonna have that sitting on your balance sheet, not adding any value whatsoever. So if we come back into Cisbro, we have a couple of reports that allow us to be able to track that. If you're tracing on serialization, you're gonna go ahead and take a look at your serial report. And if you have lots you're going to go ahead and run your traceability report. There are filters associated with all of these reports that allow you to go ahead and drill in and choose your date ranges when it comes to expiry. Because if, after all, you're going to be tracking the traceability details against individual lots and serials. So here are my selection criteria for my traceability report. And under the other options, I have my expiry date information that's available in here. As we're talking about traceability, you also want to potentially start playing with your recall options and running through as you're doing the cleaning, how long does it take for you to go ahead and do a recall? And the nice idea about the product recall is the fact that you can run mock recalls. You don't have to run a live recall, which means you don't have notifications sent out. But for certification purposes, mock recalls are always really good. Think of it a little bit as a fire drill. So that is traceability. And when it comes to inventory, really what I want us to do is think about going from this lovely messy room that I'm in into a nice, clean, tidy warehouse, because all of a sudden that warehouse on the right helps me focus and quickly find what I want. Over the years that I've been working with Cisbro, one of the things and one of the privileges I've had is the ability to go in and actually walk around a number of different manufacturing floors and factory floors. 
And I find inevitably the companies that have a factory floor that looks clean, tidy, and organized are often doing better, especially when we've got challenging times, challenging economic times. They've got better profitability and they have better customer retention. So it's interesting how by simply having a tidy floor is a good reflection on how well run that particular business is as well. But that's just a private observation. Let's move on to manufacturing. What are some of the things that we have in and around manufacturing to help you? So let's start with planning and visibility. How are you doing your planning today? Are you running MRP? Are you actually able to give a good sense of what materials you need in order to be able to run the production for the next week, the next two weeks, the next two months? And is that visibility available and bubbling up? Do you have the ability to go ahead and schedule your employees? Do you have capacity planning that are, that's built in? And that production plan as to what's going to get run on what day, is that visible throughout the organization? What about your outstanding jobs? Do you have a way of managing all of those? And if you're using forecasting and drilling that in, have you gone ahead and cleaned out your expired forecasts? One of the key things to be able to take away from this is just to think a little bit about expired forecasts. Deleting them speeds up your MRP. So a lot of this is about gaining efficiency. What are some of the things you want to think about with your master data? Bills of material. If you're an engineering organization, are you creating them? Is your engineer entering and validating your bills of material? So if I jump into SysPro again, there are a couple of tools that you may or may not already be aware of that I wanted to talk about a little bit. There's a great little program called the Structure Validation Program in your bond processes that allows you to val validate and verify the integrity of your bill of material and your relationship validation. So if you're wanting to go in and make sure that you got your bills of material neat, neat and tidy, start with that and then go in and start running your reports to see what your structures look like. If you've got lots and lots of engineering drawings that you're building into CISPRO itself, you've got an engineer to order environment, you may want to think about having an integration program such as CAD Talk. When you're going ahead and integrating your CAD into CISPRO's bill of material, it's the ability to automate and create your bills of material without having to manually enter that information in. And it allows you to quickly update as well. So some nice tidy tips in here. Are you managing your capacity calendars? If you're using a scheduling system such as CISPRO Manufacturing Operations Management, it relies on your capacity calendar and work centers to be able to go ahead and allow you to schedule effectively and efficiently. Do you have all your employees captured? And CISPRO's got this great now new functionality that's just recently been introduced to be able to link your CISPRO operators to your employees by default as well. So we're increasing the traceability functionality. Do you have obsolete machines? Machines that you might have captured in CISPRO that no longer exist? You want to think about potentially deleting them. When we're talking about removing some of these bits, you want to be careful. So machines, for example, you don't want to be deleting any machine that's already there against an open work order. So if I take a look, what I've done in CISPRO itself is created a quick little tile to allow me to see any machines that I have against live jobs. And at a glance, I can see that all of these machines are currently in use. If they're not in use, I can go ahead and delete them. Now, I did this relatively quickly with very, very little technical skills. I used CISPRO's business activity query to be able to go ahead and build a query linking my machines to my open jobs. And I've gone ahead and built a little tile to bubble that up. And we'll cover how to do this in our next webinar in the customization, allowing for quick drill down into information. And the nice part about this is, of course, you can leverage all of the CISPRO functionality to be able to export this out into Excel and do further analysis should you so wish to. I can, of course, use my grouping and sorting functionality 
to be able to go ahead and see information at a glance as well. So all of that still remains. Quick tips to be able to review and validate data before removing it from CISPRO as you're going through this tidy process. What are the other things you want to think about? Okay, buckle up. If you're a production environment, this is something that we see quite a bit. Oftentimes, jobs will remain open because they just have a few outstanding values in there. And you want to think about also items that you may perhaps have an inspection with outstanding values in there. So with the jobs, WIP and job closure, what we've done is for a couple of customers, we've actually created specifically for their environment, a quick little pane. And this is our a &I team. What they did was they went ahead and built out logic associated with particular jobs. So if I refresh this pane, it'll show me a list of all of the jobs, the stock that's associated with it, any outstanding qualities, any difference in variances in material and labor, and messages associated with that. And very quickly across all my jobs, I can do a quick analysis, evaluate, and if I want to, go ahead and post these and write off my outstanding web value to a specific ledger code should I so wish to do so. So there's ability within the customization functionality within Cisco to allow you to do this, not just at an individual job level, but to go ahead and do this across multiple jobs. Now, of course, depending on the business rules that you've got in there, you may, this is something that would have to be created and tailored for you, but it is something that we can do relatively quickly. With the inspection, of course, we're going to go back to my traditional taking a look at the standard. And within that, we've got inspection reports and the variance closure that allows you to see what's happening if you're using WIP inspection as well. So from a tidying perspective, two, two perspectives, two ways we want to take a look at this. You don't want to look at just the inspection. You also want to take a look at your scrap. The reason why I would recommend looking at scrap if you're not already doing this as part of this process is it's often a good chance for you to review perhaps whether you've got issues in your raw materials, which means you've got to reassess your suppliers, or it may be because you're dealing with perhaps a bottleneck operation where you've got a machine that might need reviewing. So think of this as a weathering. It's the ability for you to take a look at your current production processes to see the efficiencies within them. So if I look, production, inspection, and scrap all have efficiencies reports associated with them. I just talked about the inspection one, but if I take a look within WIP, we've got various efficiency reports built into this. If you're using the MOM system, which is of course the ability to schedule and capture label allocations, there are additional reports and additional efficiency reports and graphs and charts that allow you to drill down at the machine level, at the employee level, at the work center level. So lots of rich information, but think about using that and leveraging that fundamentally to look at how you might want to optimize your production flow. We talked a little bit about the purchasing side of things and what sort of stock that you have available. Supply chain is in the news and has been in the news for the last three years around a lot of the challenges associated with that. Lots of buzzwords that are coming along with that as well, coming in-house, um, various things that you have with supplier management. So let's start again, like we did with the customers at a high level. What are some of the things that we wanna think about? the all important suppliers right now. You wanna right size your supply chain. So analyze, taking a look at your supplier movements. Do you know your key suppliers? Again, similar to how we looked at with the customers, we're gonna think about and talk about supplier geographies. Are they in the locations that you are? And of course, right now we're talking about nearshoring. There's a lot of discussion around looking at purchasing from suppliers locally as opposed to having things shipped and of course, as we get more and more costs associated with shipping over longer, longer distances, that becomes a slightly more compelling argument, a slightly more compelling discussion. And I throw, throw one more little thing in here. 
which is historically when we're dealing with competition with suppliers, we're often competing with other vendors for exactly the same supply chain. Depending on the key supplier that you have, think about and evaluate as you're analyzing this, can you work with your own competition to become cooperative? Which means, can you work with them to negotiate better for a key supplier that you have? And I wouldn't do this and recommend this for all of your particular raw materials, but for items where you know it's critical to be able to keep that supplier active. And the way to do that is by giving them more business and even though it means you're now sharing with your competitor, if you can guarantee that particular supply, we've got some rich information to be able to deliver that. So reports, that's the theme of the day in here. We're gonna go look at our supplier reports. Two areas to think about, purchasing, and of course, accounts payable. Under the accounts payable, which is where we set up our suppliers, we want to think about details around our list of suppliers or groups that we put them together, our purchase analysis and our purchase analysis history. This is the invoices that we have coming in. We want to look at all of that detail tied together. And then, of course, against our purchasing, as we drill in to some of the reports that we have against that, we want to take a look at what we've ordered stock code and supplier, where are we drilling them out to? We talked about pricing methods. You want to review your contracts. You want to look perhaps at implementing supplier policies associated with that, where you may want to choose for certain items to have a round robin policy in place. CISPR has the ability to set up supplier pricing policies, and you can associate perhaps preferred supplier or alternate suppliers and drill down into it. So as you're cleaning it up, start with identifying what your key raw materials are. And we did that when we we're reviewing our inventory to then drill into how we can negotiate and perhaps alleviate some of that pricing pressure by looking at multiple suppliers associated with that. And it's very much about drilling that down. So it's, it's about thinking about suppliers in a slightly different way. But the other thing to think about here is also how are you capturing your costs? Are you using standard costing, which means that you're taking the same cost every single time, no matter whether it costs you 10 pounds the first delivery, 100 pounds the next delivery, and 50 pounds the third delivery, it is always going to go ahead and bring that down. And with such varying costs right now, we are finding that companies are starting to think and shift away from standard costing, especially if you're leveraging some of the cost plus. All right. Master data, what are some of the things you can do around master data? Very similar to what we talked about with our customers. Take a look at your contact details. Do you know where they exist? Are they active? Do you have your terms up to date? Do you have your contracts, your pricing, all of that information in there? When we come to supply chain, other things to think about. Lead time, really important, especially with the challenges that we've run into recently, lead time is something that you want to keep on top of. Dock to stock, how long does it take after you go ahead and deliver? So it's about updating all of this information. Supply chain, very, very key, very, very topical, lots of things that we can clean up and hopefully I've given you some thinking points in here. On to the finance. Now, we've touched on finance quite a few times throughout the conversations that we've had today, and it's about analysis. Now, finance often tends to be key in a lot of the things we've talked about. Within here, as you're analyzing and making decisions, rethink your risk and reward, your working capital. You may have to take a hit on the working capital to go ahead and leverage a larger supply chain to be able to have more inventory because we see a shift in transitioning from just-in-time inventory to just-in-case inventory, and that has a financial set of implications onto it because you're bringing more inventory onto your balance sheet, and it's a risk of return on that capital bet. Don't think just about margin reduction by decreasing costs by 2 or 3%. It's about being more strategic about it and identifying and delivering that unique value that you have. So it's about analyzing and identifying what that looks like. Then 
there is, of course, always the bread and butter of financial management, customs, VAT, reporting, reconciliation, balancing. So if we take a look at the analysis, we talked about this already. What are your costing methods? That you're, are those something that you want to switch out into? Consider your product portfolio. Are you selling to lots of areas, to lots of different customers and trying to be everything to everyone? Or are you very key and niche in your market? Now, a lot of these things are analyzed as part of the budgeting process as you're planning for the next year. But with the spring claim, what I suggest is revisit that. Are you on target? Are you tracking against that particular budgeted item? Is that still accurate? Is that something that you want to consider addressing? Drilling down one layer deeper, depending on where you're exporting and importing from, do you have all of the VAT rates updated? And again, post-Brexit, the UK government had a number of things and initiatives that we had. Postponed VAT was a new initiative that was added in by the government. Are you capturing that correctly? And is that something that your system has accurately picked up? When you're reporting and filing, most of the companies and organizations we speak with, they're already filing via the Making Tax Digital where electronically filing and electronically capturing all of that. Spreadsheets and individual manipulations of the nine boxes isn't allowed. And so it's just about validating, making sure that you're on side. How frequently are you filing? And is that something that's a nice, smooth process? Validate all of these things. And I was chatting with uh, one of our lead consultants earlier, and one of the, th the, the comments that she made was, sometimes customers aren't always validating this, which surprised me because it, it's something that I think we do natively in CISPRO in the ecosystem all the time. Subledger to general ledger reconciliation. So if you've got a finance person that's there, within each of the submodules, when I talk about submodules, CISPRO speak, what I mean is the individual areas of business. So in this case, if you've got your accounts receivable, your accounts payable, lots of things, suppliers and customers that we've talked about already, are they reconciling back to your general ledger? Because everything's linked. You've got this integrated already. So when I look under my general ledger integration, I have various trial balance reports and registers that I can run. So really, really quickly, just go ahead and run your trial balance. And when you're running your trial balance, check to see if the amount on the last page, just run it as is, go ahead and run it without excluding any customers on hold or anything like that, and validate to see if that balance is back to your control account. Really, really quick cheat that you want to go ahead and think about is if you query, you've got nice, tidy information that you have available under your account. At a glance, each submodule has its own details, shows you your opening balance and your closing balance. But if I drill in, in this case, for my branch information, it also gives me details specifically around my control accounts. So I want to take my trial balances across all of my submodules. I want to validate them against what I'm posting against my general ledger. So hopefully that's a nice, neat little suggestion to be able to go ahead and validate that you're doing. Now this, not necessarily spring cleaning, it is something that you wanna think about and do on a monthly basis. Only then do you wanna think about adjustments. Balancing, make sure that it's part of your monthly routine because what happens is we've got that integration. We wanna make sure that we don't have any of the submodule journals that haven't posted through. With CISPRO 8, there are a few balance options that are available in business objects, so we have the ability to automate even more than we did before. And there's some nice, tidy ways and quick ways we can use to monitor. So what I did, again, I'm not very technical, so I didn't build this out by scrap. It's something that's available just as a standard as a quick starting point. There are list views that are available and I've added them into an application builder, which is literally just a quick little program holder. What that allows me to do is pick up two little things. In this case, what I wanna see is, are there any GL journals that are currently not posted? And are there any that I have on hold? And at a glance, this shows me the information that's available and I can refresh that. 
there are also details that are available as templates for anything that's not posted from a submodule posting as well. So from a clean perspective, you can have that saved away and just go in, monitor, and run. All right, now we're getting very, very, very granular. If you're responsible for the automation, the system management, things around SQL, archiving, updating, security, dashboards, lots and lots of tools that are available for you. This is something that I assume most companies already have in place, maintenance routines, backup policy, how often, how frequently are you backing it up? But it's not as simple as just backing it up. How often are you validating? We had a customer and unfortunately, they had backed up regularly, but they had a fire. And what they realized when they tried to restore from backup was the last valid backup that they had was about six months old, which meant that they had six months worth of data that they had to go ahead and recreate on top of having to manage with a factory that had been burnt down as part of a fire. So worst case scenario, really horrible story to be able to share. They managed to get back up and running, which was fantastic, but it's about making sure that you're not in that situation. If you're not already on Cisco 8, remember not everything lives in SQL. You will have to back up files that are flat files as well. There are some great documents that talk about all of the things that you have to back up if you're not already on 8. Cisco has the ability also to archive some transactional data. You set that up and you have the ability to go ahead when you're running your balance functions to be able to purge some of that data and archive it away. For other information, depending on how long you've been running CISPRO, you may want to think also about copying it away to a historical company before purging it out. So it's about having access to that for reporting purposes and referencing, but it's also about speeding things up so that you're not going through unrelevant transactions and details. Updates, installation, that's all been improved through hotfixes with Cisro 8. And there are three areas I want to identify for you. Under the program menu, installation and hotfixes shows you what's available and it gives you some historical detailed information about what's actually been fixed. The notification maintenance tells you who will get notified if something new and a fix is available. And the installed update query shows you everything that has been installed so far. The nice thing about Cisbro 8 is you can go ahead and uninstall like you would a Windows update through the AdRemove programs. Lots of things that we can talk about in security. So these are just touch points and things that I want you to think about. Have you looked at single sign-on? But for me, the one that I like the most is multi-factor authentication. You have the ability to enable that, similar to how we do for when we log on to our banking accounts and things like that. Because remember, there's quite a bit of secure information that we have in Cisbro. And who has access to that? We want to make sure that it's not as simple as entering in the password that we have on a sticky note stuck on our monitors. So tighten that up about enabling that password maintenance to certain secure sites. Are you doing an audit of your operators and what they have access to? There's some rich reports and uh, dashboards that give you at a glance information about all of your security setup. And as we're increasing governance risk and compliance, there's not just access reports, but the ability for you to create a conflict file. And what I mean by that is if you're operating anywhere in the States or have specific legislative or certification requirements in highly regulated industries, you cannot have the same individual doing multiple tasks. So when you go ahead and run the operator report, you have the option to create a conflict file. And when you choose the operator, it will create that file for you. So it's about going ahead and using that to tailor who has access to what, and to be able to illustrate that that is in fact something that you're tightening up. Amendment journals, anytime someone changes something in the system when it comes to master data, these can be enabled and monitored. Amendment journals are available through 
accounts payable, receivable, so customers, your suppliers, your stock, your banks, your bills and material. What you're seeing on screen here is a list of all of the different amendment journals that you can enable. They are not enabled by default. So if you go ahead and choose to enable that, you have options of whether you want to do yes or no, or including any additions that you want to keep track of. And when you do that, you then are able to report on who has made the change to what, when. And that just makes it a little bit easier to be able to do and diagnose when things aren't behaving the way that you expect them to. So highly recommend you think about looking at the amendment journals. There are a plethora of diagnostics dashboards that are available. Things that, especially if you're responsible for care and feeding of CISPRO, can be really useful. Security settings, SQL, user details, diagnostic, SQL server. Give you some examples in here. This is the security settings. You can see at a system level all of the details that are available. So in this case, what you're looking at is how many operators you defined, any password rules that you have, any electronic signatures that are configured at a system level. You can drill down into company level and it will then show you how many operators have access to this company, how your program access to, is defined, whether you're seeing activities and fields, and of course, all of the different security settings that are configured. We have a SQL Health dashboard that's built into CISPRO itself, which tells you all of the different dependencies that are there, collations, various tables, indices, if there are any defined, and at a glance, it pulls all of that information outside of SQL. So you can see that relatively quickly. And I like the fact that you can also see how quickly things are growing, what the current size is, and it goes back to the backup plan. Are you actually on track? The diagnostic utility is specific to CISPRO. It's now going in and verifying your tables, indices, keys, and if that's actually delivered properly. I have one little tip that I wanna show you if you're not already aware is whenever you're in a CISPRO program itself, and if I launch a program, I can go ahead and go Shift and F7 on my keyboard to show me the program name, but what I think is more important than that is it can show me additional details when I see information about that particular user. And as I'm drilling into that current user, it's actually pulling in quite a bit of detail at this point because it's looking not just at who I am as a user, but it's then going to go ahead and show me any runaway processes. I can drill in to see details and I can see various tables and programs that are being used by that particular program specifically. These are all of the files that the information is getting stored. Any SQL blockages that are running right now, especially if you're administering and diagnosing, and that's something that you can periodically go in and clean out. And of course, from here, I wouldn't recommend it, but you can see that this particular user has been here for 21 hours. I can log them out. All right, so that's my little tip there. We've covered a lot of ground and I've rushed through quite a bit of content, but I wanted to be able to use this to give you some things to think about and perhaps go and investigate a little bit more. If you do wanna investigate a little bit more, what are some of the things you can do? We have other webinars. We talked a little bit about a CISPRO 8 functionality throughout the session today, and I talked a little bit about Brexit as well and the setup that we have against it. We do have pre-recorded webinars on that, so reach out to your account manager and Kelly, she'll be able to point you to the direction for those if you don't already have access to that. There's some supporting material with that as well. And then over the next few months, we've got some customization webinars that will drill into some of the things that we talked about um, and some of the things I showcased in here. There's training. I talked quite a bit about the standard reports that are available. They don't show you what they have. You have the ability to tailor them yourselves. And if you're not sure how to do that in Crystal and using CISPRO reporting services, there is a training course that will help you and guide you through how to do that. The diagnostics, uh, the security, how to set a lot of that up is also covered in a system administrator course. So if, if that's something that you wanna explore a little bit more of, of course, feel free.
CISPRO 8. There is a website dedicated just to CISPRO. Happy to share that with you after the fact. As always, if you hit F1 in any software program that's there, chances are you'll get a little bit of help. So don't forget to use that. And there is our help desk that's available with the email address and the phone number. So hopefully what I've done today is just give you at a very high level some information that allows you to focus back onto the key drivers in your business, be it improving your quality, reducing your costs, maximizing your efficiency, or just purely driving performance. So hopefully we've given you a few thinking points today and go back and give you a little bit of homework to help you tidy up, not just this bro, but also think a little bit differently about your business. So at this point, I do have the floor open for questions and I see that there is a question that's come up. Hello, what was the CAD integration program called? Ah. That's a good question, Anna. It was, we've got a third party product, uh, a company called CAD Talk that we go ahead and partner with. And they've got a phenomenal tool that actually allows you to integrate to your CAD solution, SolidWorks, Autodex. There's, there's a whole list of programs that they actually integrate to. And it will go ahead and generate um, a bill of material for you. Or if the bill of material already exists, it actually gives you a user interface to allow you to identify whether you need to modify the existing one, change your raw materials, your operations, and pull that in. So hopefully that helps. I see it does, wonderful. Any other questions at this point? Definitely have the floor open. Just throw them in the chat window, I'm afraid. I don't have a way to easily be able to allow you to share and unmute. All right, it looks like we're not getting too many more questions at this point. Hopefully you found this a little bit useful. If you haven't, please do let us know as well because we'll tailor the content to what you find useful, what you have to take away with. If you didn't find it useful, you think someone else in the organization will, we'll share the recording after the fact as well. So feel free to share with others in your organization, but otherwise good luck and have fun spring cleaning. Until next time, cheers all.